Okay, well, welcome uh, to the first campus conversation of, of the 2018-19 uh, uh, academic year. This is a series that, that uh, we started about two years ago, um, and the idea was to uh, discuss issues of national and international importance that are directly affecting the lives of our students. And it's open to the whole community, of course. Um, so today we are very honored to have with us uh, Dr. Daniel Ellsberg, um, and I will introduce him and then uh, introduce uh, Dr. Alba Alexander, his discussant for today. Uh, they will talk for uh, about an hour or so, uh, and then we will take questions from the audience. And you have uh, pieces of paper and a pencil on your chairs, so please uh, feel free to write down your questions, and we'll come around and collect them before the Q&A, uh, and then we'll, we'll do that. So, uh, Dr. Daniel Ellsberg is a senior fellow of the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation. He's a Chicago native, and he holds a BA and a PhD in economics from Harvard University. He also served as a Woodrow Wilson scholar at Cambridge University. In 1959, after three years in the U.S. Marine Corps, serving as a rifle platoon leader, operations officer, and rifle company commander, uh, Dr. Ellsberg became a strategic analyst at the RAND Corporation and consultant to the Defense Department and the White House, specializing in problems of the command and control of nuclear weapons, nuclear war plans, and crisis decision making. In 1961, he drafted the guidance from Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara to the Joint Chiefs of Staff on the operational plans for general nuclear war. And in 1962, he was a member of one of the working groups reporting to the Executive Committee of the National Security Council, known as EXCOM, during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Ellsberg joined the Defense Department in 1964 as Special Assistant to Assistant Secretary of Defense, working on the escalation of the war in Vietnam. He transferred to the State Department in 1965 to serve two years at the U.S. Embassy in Saigon. On return to the RAND Corporation in 1967, Dr. Ellsberg worked on the top secret McNamara study of U.S. decision making in Vietnam from 1945 to 1968, which later came to be known as the Pentagon Papers. In 1969, he photocopied the 7,000 page study and gave it to the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. And two years later, he gave it to the New York Times, the Washington Post, and 17 other newspapers. Dr. Ellsberg was arrested and tried on 12 felony counts concerning this security breach and faced a possible sentence of 115 years in prison. But the case was dismissed in 1973 on grounds of governmental misconduct against him, which led to the convictions of several White House aides and figured in the impeachment proceedings against President Nixon. Dr. Ellsberg is the author of four books, including his most recent and the topic of today's conversation, The Doomsday Machine, Confessions of a Nuclear War Planner in 2017. Since the end of the Vietnam War, Ellsberg has been a lecturer, writer, and activist on the dangers of, nuclear, of the nuclear era, wrongful U.S. interventions, and the urgent need for patriotic whistleblowing. Um, so his topic today is not directly the Pentagon Papers, but I will tell you because I met him about 10 years ago in, in Lincoln, Nebraska, where he came to speak, uh, that he has some really amazing stories that I don't think have even made it into the movies uh, on the topic yet. Um, his discussant today is Dr. Alba Alexander. Uh, she is a clinical associate professor of political science. She earned her PhD from the University of Chicago, and she teaches like courses in American politics, minutes, public children. policy, and political economy. Her articles have appeared uh, in the Harvard International Review, Congress and the Presidency, International Journal of Urban and Regional Research, and other journals. She's the author of a forthcoming book on taxation in American political development, and the co-editor with Dennis Judge and Evan McKenzie, head of our Department of Political Science, of another book in press on privatization and the state. So now I give you uh, Dr. Ellsberg, who will speak for about 20 minutes or so um, before well, we begin a, a conversation. I'll talk for about 25, 30 minutes. Okay, 25, 30 minutes. Okay, thank you. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Ellsberg. Hello. Thank you. I'm just uh, reminded driving over here of the fact that I was born in Chicago, it so happens. Left at about five. My father was a structural engineer 
who uh, once showed me a postcard of the skyline of Chicago in X over all the buildings he'd worked on, all the top highest buildings he was very proud of. He worked for Holabird and Root. Then out of work during the Depression, moved to Detroit where I, where I grew up. The title that I just heard of my talk, which I just asked minutes before, is a new one for me, and I think I'll use it again. It was chosen by the provost office, apparently, and it's really given me something to think about. The title, as I heard it, is Nuclear Policy Over the Last 50 Years. That's what I was told. And uh, I thought, interesting, an interesting figure. Uh, the nuclear era, and if you saw me doing a little calculation here, because I'm not real good at arithmetic at my age, which is 87, but uh, I figured out that the nuclear era is 73 years old from 1945, not 50 years old. And the first thing to say about either of those figures 50 years or 73 years, is that American nuclear policy has never really varied. And it's never been what the public understood it to be, ever. In fact, it was characterized uh, as very, very well in the first year, in 1945, with Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombings. <clears throat> but I'm led back now into my, my memory very much. When I, in Detroit, saw a headline that a Japanese city had been destroyed by one bomb, I may have been the only person looking at the Detroit News who knew immediately what that bomb was. Literally, I might, no, I take that back. A dozen or so of us who'd been in a class at my school, private school in uh, Detroit, Bloomfield Hills, where I was a scholarship student, had a year earlier, nine months earlier, in 1944, been together in a class on social studies by, drawn by a teacher named Bradley Patterson who just got in touch with me uh, last year when my book came out because I mentioned him. He's in his 90s now. And he posed the question relative to a concept in sociology at that time called cultural lag, the notion that our politics, our ethics, our social institutions lagged behind progress in technology, which swept ahead. And I might say, in retrospect, the notion of lag is a little suspect because there's a question of whether the former, the institutions for controlling our technology and its destructive power, have ever caught up in the sense of, have even progressed, actually. Now, there's no question that the technology progresses enormously, and that's an indisputable meaning of the word progress. But when it comes to our social institutions, our control of that, a real question. In any case, he said, in connection with that, suppose there were a bomb made of U-235, which he described to us as a, an isotope of uranium, the heaviest element, which now was known, he said in 1944, could be split and in splitting uh, f uh, by neutrons uh, getting into the nucleus and splitting it apart, releasing more nucleus, more nu uh, neutrons, I forget if I said that right, and uh, creating a chain reaction, an explosion, he said that would be a thousand times more powerful than our existing bombs in 1944. Now, just recently, I think in this last year, uh, in this last year, President Trump released a bomb which has an elaborate name but with the acronym MOAB, which they call the mother of all bombs. They, it was described as the largest bomb we'd ever had, 20 tons of TNT equivalent. But it's mistaken that it was the largest bomb we ever had. That was a standard bomb in the RAF in particular, the British. Their bombers were big enough to carry it. And they carried 20-ton bombs regularly in 1944 and 1945. So Patterson was posing the possibility of a bomb that would be a thousand times more powerful than what was then called a blockbuster. Anything larger than about five tons, five, 10, 15, 20 tons was called a blockbuster because it could destroy a block of city buildings with one bomb. So this would be a thousand blockbusters in one bomb. And he said, what would that mean for humanity if technology delivered that? 
what would it mean for us? And we weren't particularly looking at who got it or what the circumstances were. Would that be a good thing for what was then called mankind, humanity, to have? You know, pros and cons. It so happened, by the way, that he had heard about this, I learned from him this year, uh, that he'd gotten onto that. It was very classified at the time, the very existence of the atom bomb. Uh, in 1939, at, uh, at the University of Chicago, uh, not this one actually, the University of Chicago, just came back to me, uh, where uh, his, his professor had raised this possibility because that was the last year when there was open discussion of this possibility. It was early in that year, late 38, early 39, that uh, the German scientists had discovered that this was possible. Then it went underground. Okay. We, in that class, all studied that for about a week. We were to write a paper on it. And I remember the gist of my paper, and I think that of everyone else, and that was, this would be bad news for humanity. Uh, we had blockbusters. Humanity couldn't handle a bomb a thousand times more powerful than that. It could only lead to bad results for cities and for human and for civilization. Bad thing. So when nine months went by, and I read in the paper, and I remember uh, standing actually on the street corner in Detroit, uh, looking at a newsstand, one bomb, one city, and I thought, I know exactly what that is. That's the bomb we studied nine months earlier. Probably almost no one else outside the Manhattan Project, which was building the bomb, thousands of people working on it, most of them not knowing exactly what they were working on, only the top people. The final design was at Los Alamos in New Mexico. The test had been weeks earlier in July of <clears throat> 1945. But outside the project, almost nobody knew this was possible. There had been no discussion of it. It had been kept out of, uh, it was in the black budget, actually. Harry Truman, who was then investigating fraud and waste in the public, came across the fact that a lot of money was being spent at uh, several places like Los Alamos and others. Wanted to find out what it was and couldn't said, don't ask, you know, secret. So this thing had happened. And I remember looking at that headline and thinking, so we got it first, and we used it on a city. That did not look like a good omen to me. And when Truman, I was 14 then, and when Truman uh, announced very boastfully, really, we have in his flat Midwestern uh, voice, uh, this is the greatest thing, you know, we've unleashed the powers of the sun and so forth. And he was very triumphant, came to us. I thought at 14, he should have sounded more worried about what this meant for the world than he seemed to do. Uh, even the fact that the war ended a couple of weeks later didn't mean, uh, didn't tell me that this was less sinister. I don't think I've written about this in the book, and as I said, you didn't have to be some moral prodigy or other to have that worry about the bomb. If you were introduced to the idea, as we were, before it had supposedly ended a war, before it was introduced to the world as a product of American, our country, under our, in many families, including mine, sainted uh, president, President Roosevelt, reviled by Republicans, but widely revered. Roosevelt did it. We did it. We ended a war with it. It was effective, et cetera, et cetera. That's the way most people were introduced in this country to the bomb, as a kind of savior of American lives. No need for invasion. Well, that's a whole other subject about the decision making that went around the bomb. And I go into it in the book a certain amount. But let me pass over that. Actually, scientists who had first introduced the idea had had this same notion as these 14 or 13 year olds, actually, a year before. Leo Szilard, who patented the idea of a chain reaction in 1933 when he first thought of it, uh, gave it to the Admiralty so it would be secret and not known to the Russian Germans, he hoped. Uh, when he learned that Germans had, ex Germans, had actually uh, split the uranium atom and this was possible. And he confirmed this by his own experiment, seeing that neutrons were released when you bombarded uranium. 
said he knew that mankind would come to grief. And uh, later, when he and Enrico Fermi uh, produced, <laughs> it's funny, I, I wasn't foreseeing this, but produced again, not at your university, but here in Chicago, at the University of Chicago, uh, Stag Field, in a uh, underground laboratory underneath Stag Field, first had a controlled fission reaction with neutrons being released, which could, by the way, have gotten out of control uh, if, if a, uh, and, and irradiated a large part of Chicago. It wouldn't have blown up Chicago, but had it gone out of control, which they knew was a real possibility, the way they were going to prevent that was by dropping rods of graphite into what was then called a pile. I'm sorry, rods of something, I forget, that absorb neutrons. Uh, into a pile of graphite blocks, which were to control this also, if the thing was getting out of control that would catch the neutrons and keep it from blowing up. And uh, they had ropes uh, on these things with people standing on them to lower these things in if Fermi said, end this. And if something went wrong on the pulleys, they had access to break the ropes with and get it down in hopes that it wouldn't irradiate Chicago. So they, they took that chance, but it went all right. At the end of which they were all congratulating each other, brought out a bottle of Chianti for Enrico Fermi that had been saved during the war, and they drank toasts. And when they'd all left, Zillard said to Fermi, I think this will go down as a black day in the history of mankind. Now, it hasn't, actually. As I say, some years later, a couple of years later, the bomb allegedly, and the war certainly preceded the end of the war by a matter of a, a week or two. And uh, since then, no explosions. But notice now something about that situation, which I would say uh, it had portent for all the rest of our nuclear future, the 73 years of it. It was what we would now call first use of nuclear weapons. It was an initiation of nuclear war against a country that didn't have them, it so happens, what we would now call a non-nuclear weapon state. There are nine nuclear weapon states that have nuclear weapons. The rest don't. There's a few that could have them within weeks or months, like Japan, for example, with enough plutonium and designs. They have. Uh, but uh, these nine states have them. None of them have actually exploded them on cities in all these 73 years since. But that first use was a first use, what we now call uh, an initiation, and against a non-nuclear weapon state. Now, of course, there could only be first use at that time because only we had the weapon. That was still true as the Cold War began in the late 40s. Uh, 19, I was 17 with the with uh, the Berlin blockade, for example, when we did threaten nuclear weapons. Again, against the country that didn't have them, now the Soviet Union. NATO, which arose in the, around that time, 48, 49, 50, was always based on the notion that to protect Europe, West Europe, from a possible Russian attack, the United States was essentially committed to initiating war against, uh, nuclear war against the Soviet Union. And in 48, we still had a monopoly. In 49, we had effectively a monopoly, but in August of 49, the Russians exploded their first device, Joe One, uh, they call, we called it, <coughs> for Joseph Stalin. They had hardly any for the next couple of years. But from then on, NATO was and continued to be and I want to make, introduce it distinctively two related concepts. It was committed to first use against the Soviet Union, which now was a nuclear weapons state, and also a first strike, which I'll define in Pentagon terms as a disarming strike against a major adversary aimed not just at limited conflict on the battlefield, but at disarming the opponent. Obviously, if you're going to threaten to initiate nuclear war against the nuclear weapon state, which the Soviet Union had become, you don't want them to be able to retaliate, or at least to destroy you, to have the power of destroying you in retaliation. 
So from the moment that uh, General Curtis LeMay, then head of the Strategic Air Command, learned that there was a now a, nuclear, a Russian nuclear bomb, he immediately added to our target list from the cities which were exclusively his targets up till that moment, and this was in 1949-50, all of the airfields in the Soviet Union, hundreds of them, more than 500 actually, many of them of course in cities or near cities, but, uh, and some not, all over. In other words, a very large force he felt was needed to disarm them in a first strike. Initially, you want to hit them before they hit you and disarm. That has been the essence of our Air Force and Navy, Polaris, Trident, war planning ever since, which is in the event that war is imminent, either because we're in an armed conflict in Europe or somewhere else with the Soviet Union or now Russia, or if our warning systems, very elaborate expensive systems we have to detect incoming missiles or planes, in that event we're to get not only off the ground but on the way to target with missiles that can't be recalled preemptively to preempt their strike, not hopefully before it was launched, but if it had been launched before their warheads arrive and destroy our intercontinental ballistic missiles, our ICBMs. Okay, so first strike then, uh, or a preemptive form of that has been called striking second first. They're striking and we get in there. Or just escalating from a conflict elsewhere uh, where we decide that war is coming and we better disarm them before they do us. Russia, since at least the mid-60s, has had the ability, that's a good deal after us, to do the same to us. And their weapons are focused the same way. Both sides are in the course now of spending something like a trillion dollars, in our case over 30 years, $1.7 trillion to renew, to resuscitate our ability to disarm them. And they, Putin, is spending a comparable amount to disarm us in a first strike. However, as in 1949 and 50, many of the military targets they want to destroy are in cities, command and control, air defense, transportation, urban industrial that supports the war machine. It means hitting lots of cities, hundreds, thousands perhaps, even of cities and towns. We didn't know the full effect of that until just 35 years ago, 1983. We'll come to that in a moment. How am I doing here? Am I used up my time? Yes? Well. Let me uh, wrap that up because you want to get into a conversation, but I'll tie it up with what I came in at first, this way, order of magnitude here thing. When the H-bomb was tested first, a, a device in 52, but an actual bomb in 54, March of 54, things changed. How many people here, honestly, this is a select audience, know the difference between an A-bomb and an H-bomb. Can I see? Put your hands up high. Okay, that's more than usual, I would say. How many do not, honestly? Most, actually, which is the norm, uh, unfortunately, I, I have to say. We've had H-bombs since 1954, in other words. That's more than that half century. An H-bomb, to make it very simple, is a thousand times more powerful than an A-bomb or can be, to be, not all of them are. You can make them very small, in fact. In fact, one of the things we're building now under Trump is a very small H-bomb. Uh, it's so more usable, more uh, uh, easier to get a war started with, uh, with this very small. That's one of the things that's in, in, uh, in, dispute, in controversy in Congress right now. I'll put it this way, every H-bomb requires a Nagasaki-type A-bomb, atomic bomb, fission bomb, as its trigger. To detonate an H-bomb requires the kind of bomb that destroyed Nagasaki. That bomb had the equivalent of 20,000 tons of TNT, a thousand blockbusters. The first H-bomb was, actually the Hiroshima bomb was a little smaller, it was a uranium bomb, 15,000 tons, again, 15, 1,000 blockbusters. 
The first H-bomb, droppable H-bomb we had in 54 was 15 megatons. That's million tons of TNT, 1,000 times Nagasaki. Okay? So had we discussed that in 1944, and Zillard knew that's where it was going, all of the scientists knew that if we continued to rely on A-bombs, we would have, the world would have a race in H-bombs. Truman didn't know that at that point, never got to him at that time. Didn't even hear the hydrogen bomb until much later. But uh, they knew it. That's where it's going. And that's what we've had ever since. When Truman left office, we had a thousand A-bombs, fission bombs. Uh, when Eisenhower left office, we had mostly H-bombs. Not all. 23,000. When, when Johnson left office, 37,000. So it's okay. Now, I'll, I'll make the rest of it, uh, you know, uh, as brief as I can in a moment. When I worked on war plans in 1961, the Joint Chiefs were estimating that if their plans were used in a preemptive, effective first strike to disarm the Soviet Union, they would kill 600 million people. 325,000 million in the US and China alone, and China, any war with, uh, under Eisenhower, any war with Russia, troops anywhere, Iran, Berlin, would lead to attacks on China as well, the Sino-Soviet plot. 100 million in West Europe as well from our fallout. 100 million in East Europe from attacks on their air defenses. And others in 100 million in Afghanistan, India, uh, Austria, Finland, neutral countries in many cases, next to the Soviet Union and subject to their fall. So 600 million people. But they were wrong. The actual effects would have been much more than that. That's a th that would have been, have been, by the way, that was a low estimate then. It should have, they should have estimated something like, it turned out later, over a billion or a third, and that's not counting the Russian retaliation. A third of the Earth's population, then three billion. Had they used that plan we now know, the smoke from the burning cities would have been lofted in firestorms, that is, very wide firestorms, achieved, though we tried very often, only three times in World War II, once in Tokyo so wide and intense that a column of air would shoot up, raising the temperature, bringing winds in, raising the temperature very, very high on the ground, killing everyone, but doing something that nobody thought of for another 20 years or so, oh, 40 years, 40 years, and that, well, from the beginning. And that was that the smoke and soot from these cities would and will now be lofted into the stratosphere where it doesn't rain out and where it quickly goes around the Earth, and for a, we now know in the last 10 years, a decade or more blots out most of the sunlight, destroying all, well, raising ice age conditions on the Earth, and destroying all harvests worldwide, starving within months to a year of this decade, nearly everyone on Earth, probably not full extinction of humans, Full extinction of nearly other, all other large animals uh, which can't adapt the way we can, can't build houses and fires and clothing and move thousands of miles. So they all go. Some humans would probably survive eating mollusks and fish in the southern hemisphere in, in New Zealand or Australia. But 98 or 99 percent would now be killed if we used our current plan, we would die and everybody else would die. Likewise for the Russians. It's what I call in my title a doomsday machine concept from my former colleague Herman Kahn. Something that kills almost everybody, or in his notion, everybody, but this is close enough. So there are two doomsday machines, both on hair trigger, because each poised to get off the ground before enemy warheads come in on the ICBMs, which can be targeted, these plans exist despite the fact that each side has submarine forces that cannot be entirely destroyed by either each, either each other with enough ballistic missiles to destroy the other. 
and to cause nuclear winter destroying themselves also. So this getting off the ground fast with a hair trigger with the ICBMs serves no military purpose, saves no lives, ours are, is useless, but makes a lot of money on both sides for the corporations that build them. And the Russians go for profits now the same way Boeing and Lockheed and Grumman and General Dynamics do. Uh, and that is essentially the main reason why we're both still building ICBMs, which have been totally anachronistic for at least half a century since the submarine forces came in. So that's where we are. Still with first use plans, Obama wanted to go for no first use, but was overruled by his own Secretary of Defense, Ash Carter, and his Secretary of State, John Kerry, just has a memoir out today, and um, uh, the Secretary of Energy who makes all the bombs. I mean, he's in the Department of Energy. Can't do no first use. Our whole structure, our alliance structure, everything is based on the promise of first use. There is no circumstances whatever in the world in which first use of nuclear weapons, actual first use, as in Hiroshima, which was against a non-nuclear state, could serve any human purposes or ours. But building them does serve purposes. Profits, jobs, campaign donations, and assurances to our allies that we'll protect you by this threat. And we can't make the threat unless we have their weapons ready to go, thus preserving a real chance that uh, they will go. Final, then. I think Zillard was not wrong. Humanity will come to grief from this unless we change course. We still have time to do that, to do that. Uh, and uh, uh, Black Day, well, it's not perceived that day, and it never will be because when this happens, history ends pretty much, so they don't have to worry about accountability. It's up to us whether we <laughs> whether we use the wisdom of uh, Zillard or a few others, or of these 13-year-olds who came to the problem fresh without the biases of a wonderful weapon that had ended the war, if we can all act on that and change a policy that is not different under Donald Trump than on any of his previous presidents since 45. Not one of them has acted wisely, not one, to avert this. Not one candidate has proposed wisely courses to avert this. That has to change. Thank you. citizens surely needed to know. In his play Galileo, Bertolt Brecht, who had his own troubles with authority, wrote, wrote, pity the country without heroes, but also unhappy is the land that needs heroes. Our country clearly needs more heroes, yet we can't count on many people like you or other brave whistleblowers like Chelsea Manning to come forward. Whether the Pentagon Papers or nuclear war strategy revelations, how do you see the role you're playing in our democracy? Well, and also to what I was saying earlier, that the secrecy. So, can you hear me? that the secrecy, very effective secrecy, that has kept this issue from being in the public mind, except on a few occasions, uh, has endangered us very much. I don't think we would have a doomsday machine or Russia would have a doomsday, uh, Russia in answer to ours, essentially, imitating ours, which is what they did in the mid-60s. These would not exist, I think, had, this, had these dis uh, issues been discussed in full awareness of what the stakes were, actually were. 
how enormously they'd transcended World War II or any human war or any human risks ever of any kind. Uh, you know, a different existential crisis like that of climate right now, another one which is at least getting discussion, but this one isn't very much. So in that context, uh, yes, I wish that I had revealed what I knew in 1961 or 60 or 59, 61, 62, about nuclear weapons very much while I had the documents then to do it. I intended to do that later, but as described in the book, in peculiar ways, I lost my, my access. public does not know nearly what they need to know and deserve to know about this and a number of other matters. And uh, as I've said to many people, uh, audiences, in, in case some of them included people who had relatives or were in the position I had been, don't do what I did. Don't wait if you have information and documents that show that we are moving into an extremely dangerous and wrongful war or that nuclear war is threatened, or that our policies on climate, for example, are deadly serious. And you know that from inside. Don't wait, as I did for years, don't wait till bombs are falling or thousands have died before you consider taking those documents to the public, or Congress, the press. And I would say not only to Congress. I did give them to Congress at first. They were sat on uh, and eventually had to give them to the newspapers. I should have given them earlier to the newspaper uh, and let Congress react to that. So uh, in other words, there will be great risk to doing this. I was thinking the other day, a whistleblower is a job risker. And those don't occur on uh, nearly as much as we need. People will not risk their jobs to save no matter how many lives and lose their careers and possibly face prison as I did, or Chelsea, or Ed Snowden. So uh, we need more of those. Next, I'd like to ask you about your take on what to do about chronic disobedience and insubordination, not by Defense Department analysts, but by our admirals and four-star generals. Not only do you expose their concealment illegally, of a ship full of nuclear warheads off the Japanese coast. But you uncover the Pentagon's nuclear war plan called the Joint Strategic Capabilities Plan, which was carefully kept out of view of the Secretary of Defense and the President for as long as a military chief could manage. It probably would not have withstood public scrutiny. If experts with clearances find it so hard to figure out what is going on, how do we as citizens cope with all this excess secrecy? Well, what the, uh, it's very hard for any president to uh, really reliably redirect, change course especially, uh, the course of actions of huge bureaucracies like the Department of Defense or even its individual parts like the Air Force, the Navy, uh, the Marines, others, the, uh, they, have, they generally experience uh, great frustration when they try to change it. Sometimes they think they have. Um, <laughs> the, the secrecy system in this area has the presumption that these are very secret plans that have to be kept from the public. But that very same secrecy system does serve to frustrate a president's desire to change uh, if they don't agree with it. It's just, it's hard to, to get around that, actually. Uh, and all, the, the first thing I think as for the public is for the president to be aware of uh, how this system works and how it can be abused and is abused in this sense all the time to serve purposes that are not national interest, uh, but are uh, individual or personal uh, getting out, of, keeping out of jail in some cases, but uh, getting your share of the budget for various services and others. I learned in the course of this book, writing it in just the last few years, that some of the things that I had drafted for changing the plans for Secretary of Defense McNamara in 61, 1961, 
which he sent to the Joint Chiefs without change by him as his directive, Secretary of Defense guidance for the annual operational war plan, uh, had never had been ignored, essentially, had, had never really resulted in any change. And these were pretty broad-based things. One was to withhold attacks from cities, in particular, especially if, they, if there was no military target nearby or whatnot. That really never affected the targeting at all. Uh, the big one, uh, withhold uh, um, attacks on China if they hadn't been involved in the conflict. Is to give the president the option of not hitting China simultaneously with Russia in all circumstances. Didn't tell him what to do, it just tried to give him an, a possibility of not hitting China. It was only in the last year that I discovered uh, from declassified documents, somebody who had been in the Strategic Air Command sent me a declassified document that astonished me, which was that they were considering making such a distinction, not hitting China in case of a war with Russia in 1968. I looked at that, that's seven years after I supposedly wrote that withholding and McNamara and President into the plan. And it hadn't changed. Obviously, they were doing it in 68. Uh, now they said it would be a good idea, let's have a separate plan that uh, doesn't necessarily hit China. That was, that was very anguishing to me, meaning I had accomplished nothing inside. Uh, whether you might possibly withhold against Moscow, uh, it didn't seem to me clear how you would ever end a war that had begun by hitting Moscow while leaving lots of Russian submarines and some missiles you hadn't hit out there with no central command to tell them to stop or surrender or pause or anything. That didn't seem to me that Moscow should be your number one target right away in all circumstances. It always has been. And it is for the Russian, for the French and the British as well. It's almost their only target. And in short, you know, the president really did try to change this. As I mentioned earlier, uh, Obama actually asked for consideration, which he favored, of no first use. We will not initiate nuclear war. The, first, the uh, sole purpose of nuclear weapons, sole purpose is to deter nuclear attack by having the capability to respond, okay? No first use. No president has accepted that. No candidate like Hillary Clinton has accepted that. Donald Trump uh, attracted a lot of unease when he was saying, both as president and uh, as candidate and as president, I will not take first use off the table. It's got to be there as a possibility. We can't say no first use. Hillary had the same position, as has everybody else. And the president wanted to change that. That's the one which I mentioned, by the way, uh, where, again, uh, Kerry and uh, um, Ash Carter of Defense said, we can't do that. And back, he backed off. It was his last year, 2016. Didn't have time to educate the Allies or the services or anybody. The president couldn't get it. But uh, supposing he did get it. Supposing he did say no first use. Would that mean they would stop plans for first use, you know, and readiness for it? Very unlikely. Uh, and so forth. In other words, you only control these things up to a point. And that's why uh, it, and by the way, one reason for not dropping the ICBMs, which he wanted to do, is that Boeing and Lockheed, who are vying for producing new ICBMs this year, scores of billions of dollars involved, huh? this big, Weapons that should not exist and which we should pay to dismantle. They're dangerous. They're hair trigger on a doomsday machine. But you can't, you can't go against Boeing against this uh, and Lockheed. Uh, they control, they, they influence too many committees, votes, uh, donations and whatnot. And the president backed off from that too. So are you saying, um, is that, could you elaborate further on what, prospects you see for further arms reduction and how it might be accomplished? The, the big question. I now see, in background to this, and this is really since my book came out a year ago, I've been studying this particular issue in particular. I, it's not in the book particularly. I now see the Cold War as being in large part a marketing campaign 
for vast annual subsidies for the aerospace industry. And that's not a rhetorical point. I mean that very precisely. And uh, very specifically, when lo liquid, literally Lockheed and, and, uh, and uh, Boeing and General Dynamics and so on lost all of their contracts at the end of World War II, they faced bankruptcy. Ford and GM, who'd made most of the planes and tanks, went back to building cars and did very well. Lockheed and Boeing and the others had produced only for cost plus contracts for the, for the government. No expense to be spared. My father worked for that institution for a while and it drove him crazy as a structural engineer. They would use platinum, gold, if you had any invention, or it didn't matter. They didn't think about cost effectiveness at all. As an engineer, he, it, it, it offended him. But uh, they, and he had worked for Ford earlier, a different story. So they were going bankrupt. And they had to have a government order for a huge air force. And that could only be against Russia because no other country had enough targets to justify a big air force. That's been the case ever since, essentially, till now. And by the way, John Bolton's just named as his deputy, the National Assistant for Security, Sir, Assistant for National Security, a woman who came from being a vice president of Boeing for strategic systems. So as the Defense One, a, an internet uh, defense uh, journal, said, ICBMs are in no danger. So the answer here would be somehow to challenge the political economic power of the military industrial complex named by Eisenhower, which is very much a reality and which exists in Russia also, and to a lesser degree, other states, but to a vastly greater extent in the US and, uh, and Russia now, formerly the Soviet Union. And somehow to expose the danger of their policies and mobilize effort against them. That does not exist now. There's essentially no one in Congress that I know of. Uh, let me correct that. There's a handful of senators, actually 10 or 11 senators, who have said to the President Obama and now to Trump, we should have uh, no ICBMs, we should have no first use, we should not have an air-launched missile, cruise missile, and so forth. They write letters to that effect. Uh, very good. I have said, uh, when I was trying to do some lobbying in Congress, can't we raise that from 10 to 12? Answer, no. Uh, nobody wants to take that on. And uh, so, unless you can change the military industrial complexes, you don't have much prospect. Uh, a, move, a movement is getting started. I read it just yesterday. Coming out of the ICANN movement, the movement for abolition of nuclear weapons, and now getting broader, the Physicians for Social Responsibility, and uh, the, um, another one, um, name I forget at the moment, uh, of physicists. Anyway, a bunch of people getting together to start a movement for these various uh, changes. That will have to fight for attention to a lot of other important issues. This one does involve everyone in the world, as does climate, but that doesn't mean that the prospects for changing it are very good. Still, it's what it's worth my life and a lot of others to work at it. During the Cuban Missile Crisis, you note that Secretary of Defense McNamara said of the discovery of Soviet missiles there, quote, I don't think there is a military problem, there is a domestic political problem, end quote. Can you expand on what McNamara meant, meant by that? What unfolded in the missile crisis was a cascade of errors and misjudgments and unintentional or tone-deaf provocations, which we somehow muddled through. What are we doing now, and what can we further do to avert another such showdown? OK, right now, of course. Uh, the reason this subject is in the public mind more than it has been for years is, of course, Donald Trump. And it's not because he's really changing policy in any way, uh, but because he's making it more explicit. And of course, he looks dangerous to a lot of people, uh, and uh, I among them. But actually, he's not the only one by any means. I'll mention two things. Possibly the best position 
of Donald J. Trump, the only one that I can agree with, actually, and where a lot of people don't, is when he says, why can't we be friendly with Russia? Why do we have to, why do we have to regard them as an enemy? Why can't we negotiate? Why can't we cooperate? And he has a Helsinki summit, which people denounced as treason. You know, John Brennan uh, just lost the term. I agree with him on that, on all that. And that's not to say anything good about um, uh, uh, Putin or Russia. Uh, and there, how much, just how much good from a foreign, well, if she of China uh, can have chocolate cake uh, at Mar-a-Lago, uh, why not Putin, as a matter of fact? And uh, Chinese, the Chinese system is even more autocratic by far than Russia. Egypt, uh, uh, dictatorship, Saudi Arabia, whose influence I really very much uh, deplore or am anxious about, with whom we were supporting in Yemen, a, a policy in which our role and Saudi Arabia's role in uh, virtual genocide in Yemen is quite comparable to Putin's barrel bombs in Syria, both criminal on both sides. But nevertheless, the question of, so how can you collaborate with someone like, how can he collaborate with us with what we're doing in Yemen, you might say. I would like either each to be realized that we cannot afford armed conflict with the, that other nuclear superpower. But even to come, and the idea that in the Cold War, why is, is Trump announcing what seems to me a sane policy uh, because he's sane? No, that doesn't leap to mind somehow as the answer. My guess is that, that as Mueller is, seems to be closing in on him, my guess is that in fact um, uh, the Russians do have blackmail on him in the first, uh, by because he, uh, his organization, I suspect, speculation here, did a lot of money laundering for Russian oligarchs and crime syndicates and even the FSB, the successor to the KGB. And that is not only questionable, to say the least, in itself, it means that Putin can reveal that anytime he wants. Was there collusion on the election? I don't know. But it's plausible enough to me that there was. And if there was, that alone gives Russia a blackmail policy, power over him, uh, if, you want, if they want to reveal it at any point. And why was there such collusion? Why did they want Trump? Well, in part, for a not bad reason, uh, Hillary Clinton was much more of a cold warrior. I voted for her, I, I, read, I, sh I should say, I supported her. I'll admit, strictly speaking, I live in California. I, vote, I wrote in Bernie Sanders. Uh, be, but if I'd lived in a swing state, and I urge people in swing states absolutely to support Hillary Clinton, nevertheless, I would have been very worried about her policy in Syria. A no-fly zone in Syria bringing us into direct armed conflict with the Russians? Horrible, horrible idea. Uh, and uh, I would have to be resisting that now if, if it were occurring. So I'm glad that Trump isn't doing that. That's close to the only thing I'm glad about. But now, that's the Cold War in general, which creates chance for these weapons to explode and the rationale for building up the weapons on both sides. But a much more, when you say, what can we do? Again, he was criticized for a summit with Kim Jong-un. This came after his threats of nuclear war against Kim Jong-un. He's criticized, attacked for that. I do not want war with North Korea, a nuclear weapon state. That would not probably trigger human near extinction. When Reagan said nuclear war cannot be won and must not be fought, you have to confine what he meant by that. He meant war with Russia. We did, a war, a nuclear war can be won. We won the war against Japan, which was at the end a nuclear war. They didn't have nuclear weapons. North Korea does have nuclear weapons, but only a few. If there was a war with North Korea, humanity would not end. We would win. We would annihilate, that is Trump and the Air Force and the Navy, would annihilate North Korea. South Korea would be pretty well annihilated, by, you know, but as, as Lindsey Graham says, Senator, that's over there. This literally, this is, those are not Americans. 
Japanese would suffer greatly. Again, our allies, that's over there. But Graham is wrong that it would all be over there. He says it would all be over there, and the president agrees with him. Kim Jong-un does not need an ICBM to destroy an American city. All he needs is a boat. And one of his, he has enough material for 60 devices. He has maybe 20 operational weapons. All he needs is a boat uh, run by a drone to go into, if necessary, Los Angeles Harbor, uh, Long Beach, or uh, San Francisco Harbor, and kill maybe 100,000 people. Several hundred thousand with fallout aftermath. But we would still have won. The US would still exist. North Korea would not exist, our allies, et cetera, et cetera. But it would be a catastrophe from, from every point of view. There'd be more deaths in a week than we've ever seen in human history. So for the president to be making those threats and preparing for it is absolutely unconscionable. Horrible. And how much resistance did he get to that? Almost none. So if you ask what we can do, it's to say no first use, no war with North Korea, deal with this problem in one of the seven or eight other ways other than armed conflict. It's absolutely unacceptable. No first use. Hardly anybody is saying that. And it, it, <laughs> will I be accused? You know, I could make a hint. Ellsberg supports Kim Jong un. Uh, no, actually not. But I don't support war with Kim Jong un. No. Well, what about, you know, what he's doing and so forth? No, I uh, don't want it. Or with Iran, which is not even a nuclear weapon state. But no, I don't want war with Iran either, as John Bolton very clearly does. So there's a lot to oppose here, and it's not only Republicans. Uh, in my, if I may say, getting a Democratic Congress in November is essential, but it's not sufficient to anything. All of these policies lived with Democrats in our power and in office for all these years. It has to be a different kind of Democrat and a different policy and a different, uh, take Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, wonderful, except that she doesn't say anything about foreign policy to my knowledge. You know, what is she? She's 20 something, you know. I suspect her knowledge of that is not too great. Bernie Sanders says hardly anything about it. We've got to go beyond that and expand their horizon to emphasize both climate and uh, nuclear weapons and the military industrial complex conversion as well as racism, misogyny, homophobia, et cetera, et cetera. Big plate, but everything is at stake. Okay, we have a, a lot of really terrific questions, so um, if possible to answer them relatively briefly just because I have so many and they're very good. Um, all right, the first one is, as someone who's learning to become a history teacher, how would you recommend educators teach to their students the act of dropping of the bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki? Excuse me, my, and hearing, the, my hearing is such. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to say Okay, um, should I start again? Or do you wanna read it? As, as someone who's learning to become a history teacher, how would you recommend educators teach their students the act of dropping the bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki and the acts committed during the Vietnam War in order to provide a fuller context so students get the full picture. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, that's you want to stand here? Yeah. You know, uh, that's almost too big on, uh, I mean, to deal with, I would, I would go for Hiroshima. There's a lot of sources on this. Gar Alperovitz is one of the first very controversial when it came out in 64, 65, with what amounted to saying what the British or PMS Blackett had said earlier, that the Hiroshima bombs were the first attacks or events of the Cold War rather than, primarily, rather than the ending salvo of the Second World War. And there's, there's a lot to that. It's not the whole story. Uh, but there is much more to that. On Vietnam, I read an interesting thing today to bring this right up to the very present, I mean, literally right now. Uh, Michelle Goldberg in the New York Times, which I read on the way over here, driving, has a column that I recommend to you. It's very, very interesting. It says a number of good things. But mentioned almost in passing. Wait a minute. Let me read it. There it is. 
Jesus, in passing, makes a historical reference on Vietnam, <clears throat> which I've rarely seen in print. There's lots of Republican precedents, she says, for what's happening now. Richard Nixon conspired with a foreign power to win the 1968 election, enlisting the South Vietnamese to sabotage peace talks. How many here know what she's talking about? Okay, raise your hands high, yeah. Okay, how many of you have seen that assertion in the current context of collusion and conspiracy? How many of you have seen that? See, I'm where did you see it, do you remember? Yeah, pretty rare, pretty rare. Could a president conspire, you know, with, a, with some effect with a foreign policy? Uh, it's in the news now, right, that question. Uh, no collusion, no collusion, no, unthinkable. Richard Nixon did do that in 1968, and to the effect of winning the election. And not to go into it at too uh, great length, uh, he urged President Thieu in South Vietnam not to go to the peace talks that had just been laid on, proposed, by President Johnson in 68 and the North Vietnamese leadership. Not to go to those. That stopped Hubert Humphrey's rise in the polls, which had just become even or a little ahead of Nixon, flat within days of the election, and Nixon won the election by a hair. He would not have won had Johnson revealed what he knew at that point from wiretaps, that Nixon was conspiring with the Vietnamese to do that in order to affect the election, and Nixon won. And that prolonged the war by six years or so. And millions died. Because of that, and because, by the way, this is a little footnote I'll give you, because Johnson chose not to put that out for whatever reasons, uh, what reasons? Uh, again, I'll just put this out here, and not, this is not alone my opinion. At that point, Johnson preferred Nixon to Humphrey, because, uh, and he knew that would affect the election, because Nixon would carry on Johnson's Vietnam policy and Humphrey would not. All of those are matters kept secret by you know practically everybody, it takes very deep, uh, close, study of the history. And by the way, it's only, I believe it's two years ago at the most, after all this time, 68 till now, that it was revealed that Haldeman's diary showed that Nixon himself ordered that collusion. One thing staying in Johnson's hand a little bit was they didn't have Nixon on tape asking for this. They had his subordinates uh, doing it. And you couldn't prove that Nixon himself, and Nixon himself said, I had nothing to do with that. A lie, but you know you couldn't prove it. And they've now discovered parts of Haldeman's diary after all these years that say President orders put a, you know throw a stick in this negotiation by doing this and so forth. That was just in a book by Farrell, I believe his name is, a biography of Nixon, just uh, about one to two years ago. At most. Okay, so in other words, there's a lot of history to be known, which is relevant to the present. And you know, the difference there, aside from keeping a war going, is that Nixon wasn't found out. And uh, neither, has, neither has Trump yet. And my guess will be that it will come out, you know, for what it's worth. And again, <laughs> there is an ir ironic difference. Uh, Nixon wanted to keep a war going, and did. Trump, for whatever reason, doesn't want Cold War with, with uh, Russia. So uh, nevertheless, the Democrats who want to replace him, for 10 different good reasons, may get him out on what I would regard as not such a good reason, because they don't like his anti-Cold War policy. Uh, that's where we are. OK, I can ask another question. Thank you. Do you think proliferation fears affect the advancements in the use of nuclear energy? I got more. That's a, okay. I, I'm sorry, I don't fully relate to that question. Do you think proliferation fears, we have proliferation fears, affect the advancements in the use For of nuclear energy? For peaceful purposes, Well, I think. I'm not, you know, the question of whether nuclear energy, no, well, first of all, they haven't. 
you know, the, the nuclear reactors around the world have been in the face of an alleged policy against nuclear proliferation. They've basically contradicted it from the earliest days, Adams for Peace with, uh, by, under Eisenhower, which was meant to give a good face to nuclear weapons, to nuclear energy. So we gave a lot of reactors around the world. And those reactors uh, for medical use, for power use and so forth, and those reactors created the base for nuclear technology all around the world uh, and were the specific uh, bases for uh, nuclear programs like those of India uh, and others. So uh, proliferation fear has not uh, actually affected it so far and I don't expect it will in the future. Can you please speak to how Trump's so-called space force figures into, into your, this story of corporate profits uh, driving nuclear policy and war planning? So is it the same yeah. thing again? Again, we have uh, you know, it's a, a, a very interesting parallel to the introduction of Reagan's SDI, Star Wars, ABM uh, you know, program, which he put out without any advance alerting, no, no consultation in the cabinet at the time or with anybody in general, he put it out under, under uh, influence in particular of Edward Teller, the father of the H-bomb, he liked to be called that until it got a little controversial. Um, the Space Force, I, I think I've read, was, was hardly discussed. The Air Force is against it, it's a competitor to the Air Force. They have a space operations campaign within the Air Force, that's where they want to keep it, naturally and plausibly. You can make a case for the other, except that, of course, the whole idea of warfare in space and the notion that it'll stay in space is as fat-headed as uh, anything has ever been. And the idea that we want to have the ability for each other, which does exist, to shoot down each other's command and control satellites and satellites early on, perhaps as a substitute for war, thus blinding everybody on the thing. That's as much sense as hitting Moscow on the ground which has always been our plan, and the Russians' plan, and so forth. So in other words, it's another madman strategy, basically. And one more, uh, it'll, it'll give more institutional power to the people who build these weapons. Uh, it, you know, it's, there's nothing good about it that I know. It's, it's not a, an enormous change uh, in, in what we have. We already have a space command in the, in the Air Force, okay? So corporate, yes, yes, there's, I'm certain there is a corporate aspect of it, but probably just as much a kind of ideological thing, space, Buck Rogers, you know, uh, make America great again up into the heavens. Yeah. Okay. Um, do you call for someone to release nuclear policy secrets that analogous to the Pentagon Papers release would jolt the U.S. public toward opposing our policy? Yes, a absolutely, I do. Uh, does that mean there should be no secrets? No. I don't believe that. Chelsea Manning does not believe that. Ed Snowden does not believe that. Each of them withheld enormous amounts of material that they thought did not serve, that they knew, and that I knew, that did not serve the public interest to know shouldn't be out. Uh, is there enormous amounts of stuff that should be out? Absolutely. Uh, how often should something on the scale of Pentagon Papers, 7,000 pages, be released? Well, I would have said about once a year you know, if, if not more. Somewhere in the world, every month, probably, more than I waited 39 years for Chelsea Manning to do something, to do what was comparable. She actually released a lot more in the digital era. I was limited by Xerox at the time. I couldn't have done that without a Xerox machine. But with digital, she released a lot more and faced life in prison as I did. And she actually served seven and a half years. Uh, so the consequences of doing that Personal are very great. If you, if you put out a lot of material, um, enough to make a difference and jolt people's awareness, which I wish I'd done in 61, uh, you will almost surely be found out and be indicted and, and face life in prison, or worse, or ex assassination under some circumstances, as I was subject to uh, an attempt in 1972. Uh, but the world is at stake, so it can be worth taking that risk, and I hope others will do it. Is it true that there are no constraints whatsoever on the president's ability to unilaterally order a nuclear strike? And if so, when, how did this originate? 
And if not, what are the safeguards? So you, I think you were talking about the hair trigger. Yeah. And well, I've, I've said a lot in there, but uh, first of all, yes, it is true. The president can, uh, can make such an order at any time, day or night. And there is no constitutional or regulation or military uh, operational restraint on doing that. There's no basis for somebody refusing to do that, that order. For General Mattis, the uh, Secretary of State, or anyone else, or the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Uh, and um, there are proposals now, I'm not sure how practical they are, truthfully, but the, the motivation is clear. There are proposals in Congress that the President alone can't do that. Uh, the reasoning is obvious, uh, yet I don't think uh, you can in do that. I don't think you can restrain the Commander-in-Chief uh, from doing that. I don't see, see how to do it. <clears throat> you can want to do it. Um, a no first use policy, which, you know, which would, by Congress, which would raise the question in their minds that there was a legislative reason that this was an illegal order, would, be, uh, would give them some inhibition. Um, in past, uh, one thing in my book, of course, is that in contrast to what the public then believed and probably still does believe, it is not only the president who can order these forces into combat. Never has been, only the president. Many people can do it officially under some circumstances with outage of communications, need to act so fast you can't communicate with Washington. That has always been delegated. I revealed that many years ago in testimony in Congress and other places, but and now it's been uh, declassified. It's in my book, but very few people still know that. Have, it ha haven't come to it that there are many fingers on the button, aside from the number that can do it without authorization. That's many, many more. And that's undoubtedly true in every nuclear weapon state. Pakistan, uh, any of the others, India. No country allows itself to be paralyzed by a single attack on its command and control, despite which we continue to plan to destroy their command and control. Uh, that will not paralyze them and uh, will not achieve anything very useful. It gives us a little more time to destroy their ICBMs and be destroyed by their submarine launch weapons. So anyway, this, in other words, is a, a mad policy in the sense of the risks that are being taken. For real benefits, staying in office against the competitor, assuring allies, Profits for Lockheed. These are real benefits, and they may, they have real real effect. They don't justify the risk of blowing the world up. Um, in retrospect, did the status of mutually assured destruction not assure relatively peaceful relations between the various blocs during the Cold War? If we had only had conventional weapons, we can imagine that the U.S. and the Soviet Union may have more easily engaged in direct confrontational uh, as opposed to proxy wars. That's, that's a very interesting point. Uh, often in the back of people's minds when they are reluctant to change our policies, that that will make conventional war more likely uh, be, without this risk. And I, and I believe that there is some truth to the fact that the mutual ability to annihilate what we now know is most of humanity, not just the other side, not just them over there or our allies over there, but, but us and everybody else. That's all at stake now. Um, and posing that risk has, I suspect, kept the nuclear states, starting with the US and Russia, more cautious than they would otherwise have been, made it less likely that we would intervene in an East European uprising like Hungary or Poland or Czechoslovakia or East Germany. We weren't very likely ever to roll back or to get involved there, but it was a small possibility which in the nuclear era would have ended life, and uh, uh, it, this made it somewhat smaller. Good? Okay. We kept hold of West Berlin. They didn't walk into West Berlin for fear. Good. West Berlin stayed out of East, but surrounded 250 miles within kilometers within East Germany, was not 
overtaken because of our uh, threat that we would blow up what we thought of as only Eurasia, 600 million out there, and maybe the US. That threat held on to Berlin, and nothing else did. They would have, they did want Berlin, and they would have walked into Berlin as they could have easily at any time, arrested our troops there, our few troops, with or without some fighting resistance by our troops, <clears throat> and they didn't. So at the cost or the risk of ending life in Eurasia, which actually would have been the globe, we kept Berlin. People were very happy. They wanted to keep Berlin, but did they really face what the, uh, you know, what the alternatives were there? Anybody who thought that the chance of these things blowing up was zero was ignorant of this or in total denial. It's never been zero and it isn't zero right now. And it should be. By the way, it could, even without giving up deterrence, the risk of nuclear winter, which is what I was describing earlier, the smoke that destroys most life, that could be eliminated. It would be in tremendous change for the US and Russia to go down to the level of North Korea with its 10 to 20 weapons. Would that remove deterrence? Actually, if North Korea weren't trying to get H-bombs now, they'd have a good deal of deterrence with their 10 weapons. China has had no more than the ones it has now, 300. We have, we've gone down by 85%, 85%, enormous, from about 10,000. So we have 1,550 on alert now, another several thousand operational, thousands. Is that needed to deter attack, to go down? Uh, Obama said, our Joint Chiefs have said we could go down by a third, that's from 1,500 to 1,000, with no, no change. We'd still, be, uh, we'd still be doing two things. We'd still be targeting all of their military targets, including cities, and we'd still cause nuclear winter if we went. So is 1,000 enough for deterrence? Uh, yes. Uh, is it by any chance too much? Yes, if you don't want nuclear winter. So if you went down to North Korea, you couldn't cause, North, no, you couldn't cause uh, nuclear winter. And to say that, I mean, I'm sorry, if every country, not if just Sweden. No country, I would say, with the possible exception of North Korea, this is not a, an advertisement for Kim Jong-un, no country other than North Korea can justify the number of weapons it now has. The next smallest is Israel, which is said to have 80 weapons, may have 200. Uh, 80. What do they need 80 nuclear weapons for, exactly? But that's the lowest. India and Pakistan, each more than 100. Uh, France and uh, England, about 100. A little more than 100. <clears throat> China, 300. US and Russia together, 14,000. OK. If you went down to the level of China, for example, great power, you probably would not cause nuclear winter in a war. You might actually, with just 300 weapons, you could, depending how you targeted them. So even that is more than they can justify. China could not, in the face of real discussion, justify having 300 weapons. But if you went down to China, the chance of ending civilization and life on Earth would have very markedly decreased. Would any, no military effects, no deterrence effects, no whatever. And going back to your question, is it possible that in that world, um, armed conflict might be higher? You know, is it possible without the risk of destroying everything? 300 weapons, it shouldn't be any higher. We shouldn't be thinking of war with China, and I hope we're not. We shouldn't be thinking of war with North Korea, and we are. Uh, or Pakistan and India should not be thinking. Yeah, in other words, the risk might conceivably go somewhat higher, and the, pro the challenge there is to reduce that risk by means of, of armed conflict, by means other than triggering nuclear winter, which is what we're now doing. Thank you. I, I have, there's one more question, which is from um, Dr. Alexander, and uh, I, I think actually it might be a yes or no question. Uh, since we're almost out of time. 
Uh, you are a lifelong expert in the art and science of ambiguity, as evidenced by your first book, Risk, Ambiguity, and Decision. Hmm. Is it too cynical to say that the lesson of your book, The Doomsday Machine, is that politics is all about exploiting ambiguity to the advantage of the bureaucratic and corporate power players, and that leaks are vastly important in preventing that exploitation. That's a very uh, informed and sophisticated question. Can it's, I ask who wrote that? It's Dr. Alexander's question. Good. <laughs> that's why I thought it was such a good question that it just needs a yes or no. Yes. But I, that's what I thought you were going to say. But anyway, there it is if you want to say anything good else. Question. <laughs> yes, since we've come to that point. Uh, OK, that's it. OK, <laughs> all right. Uh, let's thank uh, Dr. Ellsberg and Dr. Alexander for, for tonight.